Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Data Diversity webinar, Data Management versus Data Governance Programs, sponsored today by Erwin by Quest. It is the latest in the a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Data Ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so and to open and access the, either the Q&A or the chat panels. You may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to chat with each other throughout. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link of the recording this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Danny for a brief word from our sponsor, Erwin by Quest. Danny, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon, thanks so much. Happy to be here and happy to be sponsoring such a, uh... Uh, an excellent webinar with uh, an incredible presenter. Always nice to work with the professor. So I've got uh, a couple of slides to get through before we get to uh, to the meat of the presentation. Um, it just, you know, I'm sure a lot of this isn't news to, to you folks out there, but, you know, data, you know, continues to be a, 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 an opportunity, but unfortunately also a struggle. Um, and, and there's lots of reasons behind that, you know, the types of data that we have and the types of uh, technologies that are out there continue to grow. Uh, and we need to bring all of those things on board in order to meet the needs and, and, and transform our business in the way that we want to. Folks are taking that data and they're spreading it out well beyond uh, the firewall. Uh, and running all sorts of hybrid cloud environments with data in different places where people need to get and mix and match this stuff. 75% uh, of organizations, according to Gartner, are going to be, you know, deploying multiple data hubs for data sharing and governance uh, by 2024. You know, gone are the days of the Uber warehouse that satisfied or tried to satisfy everything. And of course, you know, there's always the risk of data, especially around our sensitive data. You know, with it being, you know, keeping that secure, private and, and, and well governed being, you know, a top five data management challenge. And I thought this was important as we're talking about data management and data governance, because there are differences and there are definitely synergies and, and where they overlap. But I'll leave that to Peter. Uh, you know, my message, you know, metadata is your friend. Um, metadata is is going to help you solve a lot of the problems on both sides of the equation. In fact, for any data stakeholder out there, because there's data management, data governance, data consumption. Why is metadata your friend? Well, it helps you answer a lot of questions, common questions that go across those different disciplines uh, by providing you a real, uh, you know, landscape of your data. You know, where else can you get one place to look at uh, all the data that's available to you and, and start to try to find it, understand it, and see if it's fit for use. And if you can layer that with all of the good things that come from your data management teams, as well as your data governance teams, it really helps you uh, accelerate your time to value in terms of, of understanding the data that you have. Is it fit? And, and you know really start start making good decisions around that data driven by that data. Um, and then finally, of course, you know in, in our fast-paced world, automation becomes more and more important. And metadata is, is a great source of uh, or, or provides a great opportunity for automation because of its uh, clear understanding of the environment and all of the detailed uh, goodies that are in there that you can then start to harness and put into your art, uh, you know, your automation, uh, you know, programs. In fact, around automation, you know, just some things that come from from a, a good uh, metadata driven or, or metadata active metadata management uh, approach, you know, things like lineage, understanding the pedigree of your data, where did it come from, what happened to it on the way. Is it the right data for the for the job that I have in front of it? You know, impact analysis allow you to you know plan things and make sure that you're not making mistakes because of you're unaware of uh, you know or have uh, unintended consequences, shall we say? So reducing your deployed defects, which saves time and money. 
uh, allows your folks to really be focused on driving value for your organization. It's a great place to really start to classify your sensitive data once you've discovered it and, and provide that visibility that's going to mitigate the risk associated with it. And then, you know, really getting into the, the, the sort of weeds and the pipes, if you will, you know, allowing you to automate the generation and orchestration of your data pipelines so that people can get faster time to value from that data. And then, of course, overall for your entire organization, a place for you to discover and, and help you navigate that landscape so that every stakeholder is as literate as possible and can be as efficient as possible using that data because we're still spending far too much time just trying to find out what data we have, what it means, and if it's appropriate for what I'm trying to do with it. So really data intelligence, it's all about these simple five steps, harvesting what you have, curating it so that people can understand it from a number of different perspectives, you know, putting all the rules and governance in place to make sure that people understand how it should and shouldn't be used, uh, and then activating that to provide efficiencies and insights across that you then socialize out to a number of different stakeholders in context so that they can understand it from their perspective and participate in the larger data community, which is really, really important. We all want to get together and be social with data because we know that's going to make us better with data over time. That is also the place where you can then start to connect and collaborate. So data intelligence feeds all of these different groups and many more, quite frankly, uh, but, you know, I wanted a nice, uh, you know, uh, set of, of options on this slide. So it is where you practice data governance. It's where your folks that are designing data and, and modeling data and creating new data assets go to find out if they're reinventing the wheel. And if they are, if they need to, you know, follow some standards to do that. It's a place to bring visibility into all the efforts that are going on to make sure that your, qual your data is at a high quality. It's where the DevOps teams can go and understand what they need to do with this data as they're developing new applications and new ways to deliver that data, similar with data ops, especially th around things like sensitive data. So they know whether to you know, encrypt it throughout the life cycle, make sure that only the right people have access to it and that people are aware of the sensitivity of that so that they don't make mistakes like dropping it on thumb drives or leaving it on their, their device that goes on to someone else in the organization, sharing that out. And even more importantly, uh, it's where you can connect to the larger organization through your enterprise architecture, understand what initiatives are out there in terms of transformation, uh, you know, and innovation. Uh, people that are, you know, managing the portfolio uh, for IT as well as the business uh, collaborate together across the enterprise, uh, hook into things like service management, and really inform the, uh, you know, the, the governance risk and compliance folks that are looking at more than data and looking at the organization as a whole. So very, very powerful capability. It all starts with metadata. Uh, and if you're interested in looking at technologies that are going to help you do these things, well, just surprisingly enough, Erwin by Quest uh, does offer a data intelligence suite, which involves a, a data catalog, which is where you capture that physical data landscape and all the details behind that, provide insights like lineage and impact analysis. Uh, and then combined with a, a, a business glossary manager in our literacy suite, that allows you to build governance workflows and really provide that business and, and uh, rules and policy context around that or any other type of asset that you may think would enrich people's understanding and ability to use the data that they have in front of you. And then of course, automation capabilities to take all that and start to help you move from uh, legacy platforms to new platforms from on-prem to the cloud, uh, or to just basically manage your data warehouse, your data lake, your lake house, whatever it is that you're building in a much more efficient fashion uh, by creating automation, generating code uh, from metadata and using that to drive uh, you know, less latency and more availability in that aggregation platform. So, you know, 
If you're interested in this, please come visit us at quest.com. We have a whole section on data empowerment, which covers all of the solutions that we have from end to end that cover data protection, data operations, and data governance coming together, really giving you that empowerment that you need to become a truly data-driven enterprise. With that, Shannon, I am going to pass it back to you for the real presentation. That was a great presentation, Danny, as always. And thank you so much. And thanks to Erwin by Quest for sponsoring today's webinar and helping make these webinars happen. And if you have questions for Danny, he will be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end of Peter's presentation. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. He has written dozens of articles and 12 books. The most recent is Data Literacy, Achieving Higher Productivity for Citizens, Knowledge Workers, and Organizations. Peter has experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Welcome. And uh, Danny, pleasure to work with you as always. And I'm sorry we didn't see you at the last event that we were at, which was just last week out in San Diego, but uh, hopefully we'll see everybody out there very soon uh, for the big Enterprise Data World Conference we have coming up in March. And if the uh, all things line up right, we might even be able to entice Danny to uh, come and play some music with us as well. <laughs> so uh, uh, this title here was, uh, Shannon uh, is, is trying to get things that you all are interested in, of course. And so we started out with sort of data management versus data government programs, and then I I kind of went here well okay we could do this as a you know data management versus data governance here's a good master's level question compare and contrast right well that doesn't sound like much fun um program data management versus governance okay now maybe we're getting somewhere so how about this data programs management versus governance and what we're trying to do is achieve a common understanding because of course these two things have to work well in all instances together so uh, not that we have lots of video here and uh, just a, a quick note for the record um, this is my uh, i guess eighth immersion that i'm doing here so i am at the uh, headquarters of the department of housing and urban development uh, in downtown dc who are just getting started on another leg of their data journey so it's going to be a pleasure working with them and we're going to talk about the same exact uh, bit so first of all many people are wondering what is the data governance versus data management. And we have to understand this in the context of something I call data debt, as do a lot of other people. It's not a specific term. I'll go through and define what each of these are specifically on this. And the real bottom line to this first section is that most people don't know or care about either of it. And we do have to find a way of breaking beyond that. There are some required success factors for both data management and data governance to work in place. We'll talk about those from each of those perspectives. But really, the key is not so much how they interact together, but how the two of these topics, as well as other topics that we'll throw into here, work within the context of the rest of the organization. And it's going to be up to us as data professionals to message this correctly. When we talk about these types of issues, they have to understand it's not just blah, 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 you know, the, the teacher in, in uh, Charlie Brown, if you will, uh, on that, but that, that there is some real things that we have to do that are critically important in order to get the messages through, because if we can't get these messages through, then we're not going to be able to sustain what we need to have, which is what all organizations will need to have, a data program in the long term. There's got to be also at least a start of a very singular focus, and that is improving data's role in the achievement of organizational strategy. So we'll look at that as well. And then take that last chunk here to look at strategy, yeah. which is to say, how do data governance and data management work with respect to each other? And that data's challenging characteristics are always going to play a role in this because data does not tend to follow the laws of physics. And that makes it a little bit problematic. We'll look at some constrained resources and strategy is a way of saying, if I've only got X number of resources, what do I do first and how can I make them in that? The 
key for strategy also then is to understand that it's not about a document it's more about a process uh, and again we'll get into that and then as Shannon said uh, about uh, 45 minutes from now we'll bring Danny back on and, and have some real good and take uh, give and take on the, uh, the Q&A section on this so let's dive in here and try to understand a little bit about this first of all I, I this is the the picture I put up that had the most responses from anything on LinkedIn and over 6,000 people have observed, commented, liked uh, on this as well. I, I didn't put this up in any way to try and say how things are, but th this is simply a diagram that I have seen in many organizations that I've worked with over the past 30 years. And in so every version of it, they say, we have data, we have knowledge workers, and those knowledge workers are trying to turn that data into information. But the problem is that they are human beings, which means we're talking about wetware. That's the stuff that's between our ears. And that these knowledge workers are relying on informal communications, not necessarily understood practices. And they're often described as the weakest link in the chain of giving information value. Data management and data governance address this challenge. Data governance governs the activities of data management. So you can tune out right now and not worry about the rest of this, but let's just dive in and see what's really going on here. So first of all, uh, the accounting profession is over 8,000 years old. These are cuneiform records from back in ancient Egypt and uh, showing uh, beer sales uh, from one to the other. And over 8,000 years, the accounting profession has developed something that we all rely on now, generally accepted accounting principles. Our own version of this is that we trace ourselves back to Augusta Ada King, or known as uh, the Countess of Lovelace. Uh, Ada, the Countess of Lovelace, was the person who looked at this machine here, which is a weaving loom. You can see it's not really much of a machine, that's a manual process, but they're making a nice pattern on that loom by passing different pieces of thread through it. Of course, if you want to get that to industrial scale, you now start to make industrial size weaving looms. And Ada Augusta, Ada King, looked at this weaving loom that I'm showing you here. And the thing that's on the right hand side of this diagram here with the holes in it is their equivalent of a punch card. And she looked at that punch card and that weaving loom and said, I believe that I will be able to make a machine that performs mathematics for me. And this is her, uh, her, her diagram of a programming language for a computer that had not been made before. Uh, so we really do owe an awful lot to uh, Lady Loveless in that context, and, and she's just done a, a marvelous thing for us to start to understand, but we are very much at the beginning of our profession, whereas accounting perhaps is in a more mature cycle around all this. And the problem is that that has led to confusion. IT tends to think that data is a business problem, and their attitude has been, if they can connect to the server, then my job is done, because I don't care what goes through the pipes as long as the pipes are connected. The business, on the other hand, thinks that IT is managing data. After all, what else would a chief information officer do? And as a result, data has fallen into this enormous gap between business and IT. And this has led us to something that we need to repair, working in conjunction with IT and the business, and that is this idea of data debt. It's the time and effort that are going to take to return your data to some sort of neutral part. Getting back to zero is what I call it. It typically involves undoing existing stuff and requires new skills of your organization. At zero, you're essentially starting from scratch, but that typically in a new program situation will require an annual proof of value. Uh, again, sometimes it's very obvious. If I give somebody $100 and they give me $150 back after the investment period, it sort of builds confidence and I can do that. Well, if you're starting out in this journey, you get to do good at both. Almost all data challenges involve some form of interoperability and there's very little guidance around optimizing data management practice, getting back to zero. So we need to eliminate this data stat because it slows progress, decreases quality and increases costs all the way around. So when we talk about data management, there've been confusion over the years as we have done this. Many people look at us as librarians and say, you know, just give us a pile of books and we'll catalog them all and everything will be fine. That is, of course, a joke. Uh, on the other hand, the far uh, side guy did one of these for us as well and said, you know, if I just label everything, it'll all be fine. Or worse still, this was a Microsoft commercial from a couple of years back. 
not sure what exactly Microsoft is trying to tell us at this point in time, but it clearly isn't a flattering picture of the way you should think about data modeling activities in here. So again, the point is it's been misunderstood. Let's go to Wikipedia and see what Wikipedia actually says. Well, okay. Here's some topics in data management, and I'll show you where they came from a little bit. It also has a note on here. It says a bunch of disciplines related to managing data as valuable resources. And this is clearly a very broad definition. Even our DEMA one that we had on the website, uh, data management is the development and execution of architectures, policies, practices, and procedures that properly manage the full data lifecycle needs of the enterprise. Yep, okay, well, not a great elevator pitch. Uh, story here. How about this one? Uh, we published this a little about 15 years ago. Understanding the current and future data needs of an enterprise and making that data effective and efficient in supporting those activities. Well, all of these are good definitions, but the problem with most data professionals is that they arrive here through a different means. And it's the story of the blind people and the elephant. You've all heard this before. The one on the top thinks it's a fan because he's feeling the ears. The one at the trunk says it's a snake. Somebody else says it's a tree because they're holding onto the leg. Somebody else says it's got the tail, it's a rope, and this one thinks it's a wall. If you've only looked at data from that perspective, that is what you think all of data is about. So we used another definition for a long time here as well, and that is the idea that data is, excuse me, data management is everything that happens between the source and the use of the data. And while that's interesting, it's not very helpful. Also, it leaves out a really important component, which is that most of the time we want to set the data up to be reused, not just used. And that is a different engineering problem. So here's a more robust definition of data management. We have some things on the sources side, and there are a number of different activities that can occur, generally falling into the munging category. That's M-U-N-G-I-N-G. -G. You can look it up at Wikipedia. It's the things that you need to do before you can actually go and exploit data. You can see on the right-hand side, then there's data science, data delivery, storytelling, uh, all sorts of things around that. And that gets us to the use. But all in all, we still need to have this formal reuse management. If we don't, then we will only end up pushing data in one direction and that won't help. So our context here is really uh, data preparation and data delivery, given that sort of a context. Now, What's happened interestingly is that the group that I'm the president of right now, and I have to thank the literally thousands of volunteers that helped us to put this together to put out what we're talking about when we say data management. So this has now become a de facto standard. The US federal government is in fact using this precise definition, which says that data management has 11 practice areas that we use in order to do this. And once again, people say, oh, that's terrific. Okay, now I've got it. Now I just wanna do one of these things. Well, turns out that's actually not a very good plan either. It's better to think in terms of these things as groups of three. So you might have somebody that is looking at using data more strategically. And when I say three, you need to have those three-legged stools in place, or most data activities are going to encompass or touch at least three of these areas. So the first, version of this particular organization's approach strategically involved one round of data governance, one round of data warehouse and business intelligence, one round of data quality management. And they may alter after that and discover that they need to change something. So here we have another uh, phase of the same project, but in this case, we've moved from data quality over to metadata, as Danny was saying, it is your friend uh, around this. And now we have two X's of experience in governance and warehouse and one X in data management. Finally, perhaps a third says that we need to incorporate reference and master data in these areas. Notice again, we've practiced data governance three times, warehousing three times, but one X at metadata, data quality and reference and master data management. So this is what we mean by data management. You can see that data governance is absolutely central to this. The reason for that is because governance is a part of all of our organizations. At the corporate level, there's all sorts of things that we talk about specifically that talk about the relationship of the company to its shareholders. Typically, that is a financial uh, piece. However, even in our world today, we are starting to see things such as maximizing shareholder value can no longer be the company's top purpose uh, in order to do this. So it's a quote from Jamie Dimond, and we'll see how well they 
come up with this, but it's actually enlightening to know that corporations feel there is a duty to society beyond just maximizing shareholder value around this. So of course, if we're doing corporate governance, we need to talk about IT governance. And IT governance is making sure that we have IT aligned with the business strategy. If the business strategy is about mobile, we need to have a mobile IT structure that supports it. We need to provide measurable results. We need to have some key questions, identifying some things that are going to be really important as opposed to trying to do everything perfectly. And what we can now say after doing IT governance for a number of years, these are the five primary areas that you should be focusing on in here. We don't have even that level of guidance with respect to data governance just yet. I mentioned an elevator pitch just a few minutes ago, and I want to make sure we hit that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Elevator pitch, of course, is that you see somebody getting on the elevator or you're on the elevator and your boss gets on and looks over and says, oh, Peter, tell me what this data governance stuff is. And you've got exactly the amount of time of the elevator moving to have a good answer on that particular piece. And I want you to try to go in and look at these five, excuse me, seven definitions of data governance. I'm not going to read them to you. Again, you get all the slides on this. So you can go back and look at them, but just try to imagine explaining them to somebody and it doesn't work. So the best way to explain data governance to people is to say it's about managing data with guidance. And if we are not managing data with guidance, one might ask the question, would you want your sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset managed without guidance? Probably not. So people generally say, OK, that sounds like a good thing. The higher I get up in the management food chain, the more I change the definition just slightly to say it's not just about managing data with guidance, but it's also managing data decisions with guidance. Why would that come into play? Well, let's look at a real life example that just happened last week. There was a group of hackers that hacked a jewelry store in London. They started, they said, uh, you know, give us Bitcoin or we will start to release this uh, information on the dark web. And a couple of weeks after they started releasing it on the dark web, they came back and critiqued their own data governance practices and said, gosh, uh, your royal highness, we are so sorry, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salam. We are uh, never, ever going to make sure we have put in place good data governance to make sure that we will no longer release uh, private data on the royal uh, family as part of our ransomware to attack. So yes, it even comes up in criminal enterprises that you need to have data governance in place uh, in order to do this. This next slide is extraordinarily busy and I'm not going to walk through it. I do wanna show you, this is a, a slide from my colleague, Chris Bradley, that talks about how to put all of this stuff on one particular sheet in the sense of what do we mean by data governance and stewardship? So when we're defining data governance, this stuff on the right-hand side is typically the way we do it. I, again, wouldn't use any of this for an elevator speech because the real challenge around it is that data is a confusing and complex and detailed topic and outsiders generally don't want to hear about it. Danny and I can play music and people will listen to us. Danny and I can talk about data and people might listen to us for the right conference, but uh, we'll, we'll get a lot more people for the music than we will for the data piece. Uh, it's taught inconsistently and that's a real problem because of result, it is not well understood outside of our little group here. So here's a, an example of why that's potentially a problem. Bravo! Now, I want you to imagine, first of all, it's wrong, right? This is wrong. Thank you, Morgan Freeman. I hope he doesn't ever get mad at me for doing that because he says it so well. I love using it. Yeah, the reason it's wrong is because your knowledge workers in your organization have gone and learned about data all on their own. They haven't had guidance around this, and that has led to a whole series of problems. In fact, it led to a joke on Seth Meyers just the other night. And what are those? You have to call me to find out. Now, if you can work Seth Meyers into a topic like that, it's, uh, we're definitely way off the track here. All right, so let's talk about success factors from data governance perspective. The difference between the two, again, governance is policy, high-level guidance, setting directions, and top-down is required because most data challenges are very, very problematic.
For example, we might say that all information not marked public should be considered confidential. It's an easy rule. People like those sort of easy rules to do. It may not work for your organization. That's where the data governance professionals actually come into play. And when we talk about data management, it's the business function, planning, controlling, delivering the information. It's intense, it's detailed, it's too complex for any one individual to understand. So we need some architecture in addition to the engineering parts and delivering data to solve those particular business challenges. Because when we look at what's happening here, poor data manifests itself as multifunction challenges. We need people to be able to go back and see through the business and IT systems where the business challenges may manifest themselves. And if we don't have a dedicated group that can look through all of these and say they are all caused by poor data, I contend that all business problems have a data component to them, we will never be able to master the, the amount of critical mass that we need. So eliminating the data debt requires a team with specialized skills that are deployed to create repeatable processes and develop sustained organizational skill sets. Because organizations are perceived by outsiders as machines. While you may have many systems that are there, they're going to take inputs from citizens and others and outputs from citizens and others. And essentially what that means is everything that comes in is going to be data and everything that comes out is also going to be data. The question is, how do you determine what to manage formally? If we put too much controls in, it will be too expensive and slow. If we do too little, we're missing opportunities. And interoperability is the primary determinant of value in order to do this. So our data governance ideas cost millions each year in organizations in productivity, redundant and siloed efforts, poorly thought out hardware and software purchases, delayed decision-making, reactive instead of proactive initiatives, and finally, 20 to 40% of all IT spending can be tied back to better data governance initiatives on this. This next chart is going to spend a few minutes on here just to, to get a sense for how governance works in organizations. Typically, there will be some sort of somebody's put in charge as the data leader. Probably like Beetlejuice, you said data too many times and somebody thought you were the data person and therefore you now are in charge of all the data for your organization. Congratulations. And just a, a thing that Shannon and I noticed last week at the data governance conference, the average size of non-large company data governance initiatives is one person, exactly one person. Very few people had teams last week. They're starting out doing their best uh, in order to get started, and they have a limited amount of feedback and things. So we start something called data governance, and people understand that that improves data over time. No problem, we'd like to do that. But some people consider that to be very slow. In other words, if I'm at the bottom of Niagara Falls of data, and I tell people that I have cleaned up the water problems, I still have to wait for that water to wash its way through the system. It will take time. And that is not fast enough for some organizations. So they also start up what they are called data improvement projects. Now, sometimes this is under data governance, sometimes it's under data management. It doesn't matter as long as it gets done. That's really the key. Although most organizations are now adopting a proactive role of data governance in here. And so they can start to get better feedback and look at what's happening from their data stewards, their data community participants that are there and everybody else who's playing in that area as well. We're really good in general in our community about celebrating when data things happen. Yay, I got it to a certain point. I've moved to this. I've achieved this scale. I've eliminated uh, quality problems in a major way that makes the data set fit for purpose at this point in time. While those things are good, we also need to get better at relating them to organizational things. And I've put the approximately equals sign between these two because we are still in the process of mapping this. This is an area that most organizations still can benefit from improvement. So while it's fun to say, yes, I celebrated something over here, we also need to say, and therefore this business outcome is now possible. And I did something else over here and I did something else. Again, we've got lots of things that are going on here, but if I can't translate that into something that somebody can see is of value, 
we are not going to have a sustainable process. And of course, once you start to make these value propositions much more sustainable, your organization will now be in a better position to say, hey, if you take the chocolate that you're producing out of this particular exercise here and combine it with my peanut butter, I can have something really good at this point in time. Most data governance organizations work as a part of data management, and I liken it to a firehouse type of situation. Uh, certainly, we don't have fires all the time, and consequently, the firemen do other things when they are not fighting fires and saving lives. Things such as battery programs to replace the batteries in the smoke detectors, a fire education program, looking, letting kids know that LED light bulbs are uh, much better, much safer for your home than are the traditional incandescent light bulbs that are now accounting for almost 30% of domestic fires at this point. That is a real interesting characteristic. So we're going to be doing some firefighting, but we're also going to be doing some planning and fire prevention in the process. In addition, as your groups are getting started with the process, there's a, a, an old uh, uh, television series called MacGyver. I'm just going to play you a little clip from it. Harmless. Of course, he is the jack of all trades in there and understands how to marshal the people that are involved in these exercises in order to build better in this case. So when we look at the success criteria for data management and data governance, we want to have one set of directions at a time. Very important to understand strategy from our perspective is going to be a sequential operation. So never put out a strategy unless you label it version one, because then they will expect version two in order to come up with it. But don't tell them it's got to go up and down at the same time. It's impossible. Don't require those of us that are non-data people to learn too much. We need to really spoon feed it to them and give them very simple examples so that they will be able to see the things that they want to see in it because they of course are the expert around that. The organization itself gets to tell you when things are better. A lot of organizations like me to come in and tell them how they're doing and it's like, Really, you don't want me to do that. You want your own organization to understand the improvements that you're making in your organizational data practices so that you're able now to go back out and do things faster, better, and cheaper. Organizationally, for example, we might have gotten very good at compliance. By the way, does anybody think that compliance burden is going to decrease in the future? I didn't think so. So yeah, we might as well get good at doing that. And Let's make the entire organization measurably more data literate. Now, the data literacy part is very important because all of your knowledge workers, for the most part, have not been educated to do things with the thing that they use as raw material the most, the data. So we need to make everybody more data literate. We don't make them, need to make them all data expert. And moving ourselves from a refocusing of data efforts to support organizational strategy as opposed to optimizing it. Most organizations are doing all kinds of things with data and that's great, but they aren't necessarily focused on organizational strategic efforts. So we wanna to try to get these pieces in place, make the move, again, pop back up here for a little bit. And now let's talk about messaging because you've got to be able to have messaging at work in this context here. It's no surprise to most of you, I'm sure, that most organizations have had some bad data decisions. Uh, again, the, the focus here is half of them uh, have done this according to that latest survey that's there. And this leads us to something that we call the bad data decisions or the illiteracy spiral. And that is because business decision makers are not data literate and the technical decision makers aren't either. Consequently, they make bad data decisions. Those bad data decisions lead to poor treatment of organizational data assets and poor quality data, which leads again to poor organizational outcomes. Of course, if you look at this sort of squinty, you can see this is the same thing it says on the shampoo bottles, lather, rinse, and repeat. And what we wanna do, of course, is break out of this particular cycle. The most popular example that I have found, and it just today found a, a 13th instance of it, where organizations install a package called salesforce.com. 
Salesforce is quite good software. It's a consumer relationship management, customer relationship management software, works in the cloud, very, very nice. And they have a major challenge because I have found 13 organizations in the last 24 months alone who have all installed Salesforce and then decided to clean the data. Now, the reason that's a problem is because the customers who are using the output from salesforce.com, whether it's your Salesforce or your management, can't tell the difference between salesforce.com not working well and salesforce.com working well, but serving up bad data. That's a fine point that most people are not able to get. And it leads us to one of the primary takeaways from all of this. Everybody asks me, why do I call my company anything awesome? And this is the uh, little bit that I put together to just illustrate it. You see, when you start out in this business, you eventually learn something called garbage in, garbage out. If you don't get garbage in and garbage out, there's a lot of other things that are going to become more problematic to you. Garbage data and the perfect model are still going to give you bad results. And it doesn't matter if you've got a data lake or a master data management solution or any kind of technology piece in the center, it's always going to be true that garbage data is going to lead you to some very significant problems. And most organizations don't have, of course, just one of these, but quite a number of them. Changing the quality of that data allows us to harmonize the data flows. We oftentimes were sending the same data around twice or three times. And now we can start to evaluate the quality of the outputs because only now can we get good data after the results that come through. Again, necessary but insufficient conditions in order to do this. And just to finish the thing, in today's environment, the most astounding and, and really problematic area uh, is, is one around machine learning. So we've been doing artificial intelligence for some decades and we understand pretty much what it is. We've done a, a good job of creating what we call learning algorithms. The algorithms can sit down by themselves and learn how to play chess or learn how to clean data. And again, lots and lots of good things around this. But the, what happened is, and, and we wrote it in the, the data literacy book, uh, which is just incredible. We thought 2020 was going to be remembered as the year that AI ran out of data to train its training algorithms. Of course, COVID got in the way with all that and gave us, but we still haven't fixed this problem where machine learning challenges are just simply stopped because they don't understand how to get the data that they need in order to train the algorithms. There's several stories around about this. I can put some references for you at, at some point in time on this, but it's nevertheless a big, big challenge in organizations. And the primary problem with this is the lack of a programmatic approach. Some of you on the webinar here today, I guarantee have achieved uh, some level of status with PMI, the Project Management Institute. We copped their, their uh, piece uh, where, where they uh, called their body of knowledge, the PMBOK, project management body of knowledge. So we called ours the data management body of knowledge. Problem is DIMBOK doesn't sound quite as good as PMBOK. But the point is anybody who is a project manager is going to understand that projects have a start and a stop and data is a programmatic activity that we have to treat in a very different fashion. Your data program must last as least as long as your HR program from this point onwards. If you think that data is going to be less in the future, then you probably don't need this, but I would really challenge you whether you think you're going to need data less. And the reason for the confusion is because we've asked our chief information officers to focus on many, many different things. But we've also observed that we need to focus more on data in order to do this. So we created the title chief just to make sure that everybody understood when the chief of police speaks, that is what happens. The chief financial officer, again, is the highest authority on financial matters in the organization. The chief risk officer speaks to risk. The chief medical officer speaks to all sorts of other types of issues within a healthcare organization. And most importantly, the chief financial officer doesn't balance the books. The chief risk officer does not test the software and the chief medical officer typically does not perform surgery. We're going to make progress in data management when we start to put somebody into the top data job. I wasn't particularly a fan of chief data officer, 
mainly because the first thing that happens when you add another chief to the already growing pile of chiefs, by the way, CDO, there are more chief digital officers out there than there are chief data officers, just to keep us in our own humble sense. Uh, CDO also stands for chief dream officer. I looked last time, there were about five of them out there, which was interesting, but probably not going to get us to the levels that we're trying to get to here. So you can call it what you want, top data job, enterprise data executive, chief data officer. We need somebody to be in charge and to liaison with the top IT job and to dedicate what they do solely to data asset leveraging, to be unconstrained by an IT project mindset. That can take an entire hour for us to go through as well. But again, projects start and stop, whereas data tends to be continuous. And finally, to get the real perspective on what's happening with data in the business, we need to be able to report into the business area. Because if we can't report into the business area, we're not going to be able to understand. We're always going to be talking about going to learn business rules. You know why we call them business rules? Because we start out in IT and we go to the business. If we're already in the business, we don't learn business rules. We learn how things are done. And there's a big, big difference in that. So we're continuing to move our way through here. Again, last part of this now is how the two of these work together. And that's really critical because if you don't have that ability, you have a very big challenge of internal incoherence, much less external incoherence. So the first question is, all right, what is strategy? Most people think of strategy in the business school sense, which only started in the 1950s when Peter Drucker and others discovered the military term strategy and said, boy, we could write books on that and sell lots and lots of consulting services. I'm making a little bit of fun. I'm a consultant as well, but nevertheless, it is an important component. We don't want to think of strategy as a grand plan because then strategy becomes a thing. Instead, the better definition of strategy is derived from its use in the military, which is a pattern in a stream of decisions. And that is much more of a process than it is a thing in order to do that. I took my guidance on this one from one of our previous presidents, General Eisenhower, uh, who said, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but that planning is indispensable. Now, why would you need to plan for data? Well, let's just take a look at some numbers. For the entirety of 2020, Zoom hosted 208,000 participants every single minute. That is an immense engineering feat. Netflix streamed 400,000 hours of video every minute of the entirety of 2020. By the way, it's down from almost 700,000 hours before that. So competition is coming, Netflix, watch out. YouTube loaders, excuse me, YouTube users uploaded 500 hours of video every minute for the entirety of 2020. Consumers spent a million dollars a minute online. LinkedIn users applied for 70,000 jobs every minute. Spotify's got almost all the songs added, so they're having to find new songs that they can add. And they only added 28 songs every minute of the entirety of 2020. And Amazon shipped almost 7,000 packages. Users spent almost $4,000 using mobile apps. By the way, these numbers are from domo.com. They've done these numbers every year for the past couple of years. The new one should be out just in a couple of weeks and we'll get to look at Data Never Sleeps number nine and see how these numbers change during the 2021 uh, calendar year. But what it does get us to is a quote that our good friend Micheline Casey uh, put forward. It's the idea that there will never be any less data than right now. And if I make a mark there and wait a minute, I can say the same thing and it will still be true. Data is going to continue to expand because there is a demand for producing data in this context. We call it the surveillance capitalism industry. Again, Shoshana Zuboff has written a wonderful book in that area and we used it as the focus of our data literacy efforts around that as well. The supply and demand for this, even in spite of the growth we've had in data science, data is outstripping our demand to our ability to, uh, to Accumulating 30% and we're only increasing the workforce at 6%. And I will also consider the process that we are likely not training them 
the way we'd like them to be trained as well. Let's keep moving on this. Again, when we talk about data as our sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset, it really wins when we compare them against other strategic level assets. But the problem is most people think of it as data as the new oil. If you Google that phrase, you'll find 5 million hits plus on Google in the way out there. I don't like that term because it only implies that you're going to use the data, not reuse the data. So I, when I see people say that, I, I do stop them and I say, let's, let's think about it slightly different. Let's just talk about data as the new soil. There's two important definitions around that. One, you don't just fling seeds anywhere and hope that good things happen. And two, you don't plant things on Monday and expect to eat them on Friday. It takes time and preparation in order to do it, but we also need to sell the sizzle. There's gotta be a regular demonstration of value in order to do this. As such, data deserves its own strategy. It deserves attention on par with similar assets, and it requires professional administration to make up for that bad data debt. Here's an example of data debt. Uh, in 2020, Forbes ran an article that valued American Airlines at the market value of $6 billion and United Airlines at a $9 billion variation. But the same analysis valued the data in the AA Advantage program between 20 and $30 billion, and United's was at $20 billion. This is a complete disconnect here. And if those airlines could double that, uh, their market value or triple in the case of American Airlines, just on the basis of managing their data better, you better believe that they are paying a lot more attention to this right at the moment. Because the main challenge around data is one of separating wheat from the chaff. Now, we talk about this and people start to say, well, is well-organized data worth more? And we can go back before the information age to ask that question. If we look at it before the information age occurred, we had page numbers, indices, diagrams, all sorts of things. By the way, from a wonderful book here by Abby Covert, a $10 Kindle download, and I've put some links to some of Abby's other work up there. She's done a great job of articulating this. If I take the spine off the back of Abby's book, and disperse them without page numbers, the stuff disappears very quickly. So yes, better organized data does increase in value. And it's a good argument for both data management and governance, but even more so to the point that 80% of organizational data is rot. Rot doesn't mean it's rotten, it means it's redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And the question is, where do you go eliminate this stuff? So let's see how the two of these work together. Remember, we'd start off with our organizational strategy, whatever it happens to be, and our data strategy can only be there to support the organizational strategy. It has no other purpose. How are we going to use data better to achieve the organizational objectives? When we then use that as input to our data governance efforts, what data assets should be doing to better support strategy? And we'd come back on that and say, how well is all that working? Uh, again, in Peter's world, data governance also has been put into the IT projects that are going on. So how is the data delivered from IT? And then eventually we get to organizational operations, get into that secondary effect. Once again, in order to do that, we're going to put a feedback loop in there and of course recognize that data is not the only thing that organizational strategy is based on, but it is becoming increasingly more important as we do this. I wouldn't show this diagram outside of the data community here, so let's simplify it for just a little bit and add in how does data management go? Well, this is the agreed upon improved support for the strategy. That's what we should be doing with this. And a couple of other points on this, our data governance goals must be expressed in terms of business goals. Cleaning the data is a wonderful goal, but selling more stuff because we have clean data is really what we want to talk about. And as Danny said before, metadata is your friend. The language of data governance is metadata, absolutely. And until we take these things and put them into data management objectives, we have a big challenge with how to get all of this stuff to work. Of course, we need a feedback loop that goes back into the data governance. Remember, they're steering up top and trying to get things to work as we go through this. Now, from a strategy perspective, the one I like to adopt is something called the weak link in the chain. Some of you may remember a book called The Goal. It's a wonderful book about Alex Rogo and uh, all sorts of things that happen there. But what it really is talking about is that in any system, there are going to be a small number of constraints that are going to constrain our performance. And the theory of constraints says find one, fix it, and move on to the next one. It's very simple, it's easy to explain, 
and it works. Our theory of constraints process looks like this. We identify the constraints that are there, whatever they happen to be in terms of your data world. We exploit that constraint, which means try to make quick fixes operationally without having to major uh, change anybody's rice bowls or anything along that. If not, we need to subordinate other problems to that problem and elevate the constraint to where it can go be alleviated. I know that's using the two words in different format, but uh, it actually works in that context. And if that doesn't work, go back and repeat it until we fixed it. So don't just say, oh, we ran out of money or whatever other piece it is that we need to do. Because of course, our process of doing this cyclically means that over time, we can increase the capacity and improve our performance in data management and change our focus from reactive to proactive. So a data strategy is going to give you a singular focus on improving data's role in achieving strategy. It's the highest level of guidance that's available, focuses on data activities, excuse me, focuses data activities on business goal achievement. That's really the key there. And it provides guidance when faced with a stream of uncertainties or decisions. Data strategy most usefully articulates how data can be best used to support the organizational strategy and usually involves a balance of remediative as well as proactive measures in order to do that. And when we look at getting started with this process, whether it's data management or data governance, it follows a fairly similar type of pattern in order to do this. We start out on the left-hand side here and we say we're going to assess the content, we're going to define a roadmap, we're going to secure executive mandate, we're going to sign the first round of data stewards. Only put so much effort into that because what you really want to do is get better at executing the plan on the right-hand side. And if we start to cycle through those, it will be a whole lot more useful to the organization much faster. What I see is organizations getting stuck on the left-hand side of the diagram that only occurs once, as opposed to practicing and trying to get better with respect to the overall. So we're coming up on the top at this point here. I'm just going to do a couple of quick takeaways and then invite Danny to come back and, and, and talk with us about your questions, which are always the most fun part of what we do on these uh, programs here. So we've talked about understanding, first of all, what is data debt, and that data management and data governance are both techniques that we have created in order to resolve the data debt. Data management is about doing things that data governance wants to govern, but most people don't care, so don't try and talk to them about it. Instead, talk to them about problems that they have and how you can help solve those problems. That the success factors for governance and management are necessary but insufficient conditions. And there we also have to have other pieces that go into it, which is understanding the existing environment and understanding the, the functions that people are talking to in this case. And that these two practices have to work really well with the rest of the organization. That there's a big, important messaging component on this, that we understand that this is all of critical importance in order to get us, and that your program is going to be a data program uh, in order to do this. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, that you need to apply these things strategically in order to come up with a very good use because you have only limited number of resources. Again, nobody's working with multi-billion dollar budgets in this space, although I know several companies that might benefit from that. So let's do a couple of quick takeaways and then we'll get to the top of the hour. Uh, again, this discipline has not had 8,000 years to formalize its practices. So it's going to take us a little while longer and it's okay to say we can work with some existing imprecision and uncertainty. We have not developed GAP, although there are lots of people trying to work on that. What we really need to do as a community is pull them all together so that everybody's working and rowing in the same direction that your data does require professional administration to make up for its past neglect. If you want to hire a guru to do this, that works out fine, but most of this stuff isn't rocket science. You can definitely make use of resources such as Dataversity and their associated programs in order to do this. Your existing knowledge workers don't have a clue how to do this, because like the guy that was throwing the pink balls at the keyboard, they found out how to do it and make it work. It's not the best way to play the piano. It's an entertaining way, and Wally Easton makes money doing it, but you don't want your knowledge workers making up their own data management practices. There are good, well-proven 
best practices that we could start to use now. And it's likely that your organization will require a new business focused data program, not a data project. The one thing that I hear over and over again is when are you going to be done with data governance? Well, you're going to be done with data governance when your organization no longer needs an HR program. It's exactly the same point in time. Data government and data management are major data program components and in concert, they must focus on improving your data, but they must also focus on improving the way your people use your data because only with better data and better knowledge of people skills how to do this can we show people how to use data to better support the organizational strategy and this can only be accomplished using an incremental iterative approach and applying these formal transactions along the way so we get off the ground we do it once and we come back for another cycle and do it again because that's the way we need to work on data around us we've got some upcoming programs here but now it's my turn to uh turn the table back over to uh shannon here and invite danny to come back in and join us for a little q a again books on sale but that's just for the publisher I love it. Well, Peter, thank you so much for this great presentation. And if you have questions for Peter or for Danny, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, we will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation. So, um, I just can't resist making Shannon laugh occasionally. So. <laughs> <laughs> Try and trip me out. <laughs> It's true. And we've got a hashtag data quality matters here. I love that. So I think that we, I'm going to start tweeting that out. Um, people have it tattooed on their, right? Yes. <laughs> and there's also another comment here. It's not really a question. You know, I've always considered data governance the quote unquote umbrella under which all other aspects of data follow, data quality, data management, BG, et cetera. Anything else you want to add to that comment? Danny, did you ever have any conversations with Larry English when he was alive? You're talking to a guy with a, 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 a memory that, that has a, a, a very limited capacity. I do, but um, the, the too favorite many argument between them. And <laughs> the, the favorite argument that Larry used to get into, he would say data management is a sub-discipline of data quality. And we would know, no, and it's the other way around, Larry, data management is the over-discipline and data quality is the sub-discipline of it. And he could go for hours back and forth arguing that particular question back and forth. Um, it, it's certainly, you know, they are related. And, and the key to this is that you have a very complex process. And Danny, you've seen, I mean, you've probably seen more data models than I, you know, I have uh, as far as that goes. Uh, you know, it's a very complex piece and we've got to have both soft and hard skills in order to keep it working. Absolutely, especially when you get to the nuance of it all, right? And because those nuances are critical, right? Yeah, that, 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 that's that's where the that's where the art comes in. You know, there, there, there's a, definitely a, a defined science, but you need to layer that art on top to really truly get it to where you want it to be. Absolutely. And again, our accounting cousins have some very very good practices that they've established. But imagine this, I was having a conversation with a, a, a gentleman at Shannon's conference the other day, and he works for one of the state departments of transportation. And he said, you know, where can I go to get the guidance? And of course we said, you know, join the webinars and all this sort of thing. But isn't it a shame that in our country, all 50 departments of transportation are having to learn this on their own? And I'm pretty sure the same thing's happening in Canada, right, Danny? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you don't have, you know, have worldwide programs or, or global programs that say how to do these things. We're, we're, we're all figuring it out as we go along. I love it. And lots of great questions or lots of great comments coming in. Um, uh, this person, uh, I've always found the opposite to be the case. The business does not understand that they own the data and that they are responsible for the data. IT only handles what is done with the data based on the requirements provided again by the business and data stores always seem to be on the business side, only the business side can determine the valid value, what the valid values are. What do you think about that? Dan, you want to take that one first? Well, <laughs> I don't want to throw DBAs under the bus, but they may have been working with DBAs for too long because, you know, when you talk to a DBA, in my uh, in my experience, they own the data. 
I, I keep telling them they don't own the data. They own the database tech, the database and the database technology that it runs on. So uh, I think that, you know, it's something I've seen over my 30 odd, you know, 35 year career now uh, that, that the business is actually understanding that and actually relishing that fact and and sort of now starting to to put their foot forward and i think you know we kind of scared them off with technical gobbledygook for a long long time but i think the realization is is becoming very clear and now it's you know depends on what's the legacy in your organization in terms of what's the effort to un, un unbind that twine and it is the, the first book I wrote was supposed to be called Untangling the Legacy Knot. <laughs> Again, the, the metaphor is perfect, Danny. It, it, many organizations, because, and, and I'm going to take the hit on this one, we in the academic community have failed miserably on this. We have taught people for 30 years that the only thing you need to know about data is how to build a new database literally that is it and so consequently people go out of here and when they see a business problem they go i was taught how to do that in school give me a new database creation tool and i'm going to now build a new database for you uh so it's no surprise it's almost by design that we've you know got ourselves into this situation but the the ownership question is an interesting one and danny you gave a, a very very insightful piece right there because if you go back to it and say okay if you guys own the data show me what are the rules around this one piece whatever it is just pick something at random and it you know they may be able to go point to a program that processes it and if they can find the code for that program they may be able to go through that code and understand it these are things that the business people know intuitively they know for sure that if you tell them you're going to reward your um, salespeople by the number of shirt orders that you produce every shirt order will contain exactly one shirt because that's the way they maximize their behavior Business people understand these rules, they work with them, and the IT people don't and haven't been. It's just not been an interest to them. Although I will say there is one part of IT that you can find as an example for this, and that is that any large size company is going to have a networking group. And that networking group has somebody whose name is attached to making sure that people have access to the network. So in other words, there's a list of people who are allowed to get on and people who are not allowed to get on or however you manage that particular piece. That is a data management function in and of itself. And if you look at that in a 30 person IT group, there will be three people that will be concerned with that particular process, which is an example to say, look, even within IT, you are doing some data management. Imagine now, here's not just one thing that I want you to find out, but here's an entire set of, of characteristics that we now want to feed into. Again, we'll go back to the salesforce.com example. We want to put all this stuff in Salesforce. Where'd it go, IT? And IT will turn around and say, nah, nah, that's your problem, you guys. So here's a spreadsheet. You show us where each piece goes and we'll put them wherever you want to. You can't have this anymore. It's just not working. Right? It's very conversational today, you guys. I mean, the data has to be owned and accountable to the business, not IT. And there's lots of upvotes on that added. We could upvote that one, we would, right? <laughs> that'll come along. Yeah, really. That'll that'll come along when the simultaneous translation comes in, Shannon. That's why I think people are still looking for that one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me throw in a question here. Um, can data cleansing and normalization um, or the use of standard non quometers remedy the dirty data issue? Sometimes. Uh, again, Danny, you can probably pull out an example or two from uh, your experience here, but just having the data clean. Well, okay, so if I give you the number 42, right, there's a, a number, it, it's clean, right? Anybody know what it means? Is it Jackie Robinson's uh, jersey number? Is it the, the life universe and, and uh, everything from Douglas Adams? Is it my age 18 years ago? You know, yeah, it's clean, but it's not enough. So Why? clean is a good start. Yeah, and, and and clean is an and, you know everybody has a different definition of clean, but you know uh, clean doesn't really think about the the concept of complete or or if it's in in its original state because it 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 may be clean to the to the eye, but if you don't know what happened to it on the way, how has it been degraded? Is it, it so that's as much a part of a quality as to, as to whether it fits a certain set of parameters in the box that you've defined to put it in right so um you know and that's why i think you know things like lineage and and, and all of those things become you know more and more critical path 
and we're seeing it with our customers that it is the top, you know, one of the top things they're looking for and one of the hardest things they're trying to find because clean in a database is one thing, but clean from a business perspective is a whole different set of questions and one may not be equal to the other. Indeed. All right. So, um, so many comments here. I love it. So how do you determine the value of data? We get this question a lot, Peter. So I love it that it's coming up again. The real trick to that goes back to the one slide that I showed about interoperability. We don't have all the resources. Even if you have one of every tool that Danny's uh, organization in order to do this. And so consequently, it's been very, very difficult for people to, to, to put value on it. And many times people simply say, you can't put a value on it. I disagree with that particular statement uh, on this. And, and the reason I'm pulling this particular slide up is that you do have always a balance. We could manage everything perfectly and nothing would ever get done. Or we could manage nothing, in which case we'd probably be out of business. So the answer is clearly in between those two extremes. and what we're trying to do is figure out how valuable it is. So if somebody says, could you clean that data or could you migrate that data or could you merge that data? Again, different pieces that go into different uh, uh, requests. Uh, the question of value comes up when we say, hey, what will that get you in terms of the, the answer? So I'll, I'll relate a, a slight little data science story here uh, to, to, to talk about it. Um, a colleague was a new data scientist in an organization, got to the point where something really good was happening and went running into the CEO and said, hey, I got a, a, an 82% on this particular uh, piece that I was trying to work out. And the response was completely unexpected. The, the CEO's face turned red and it turned around and said, listen, just so that you understand that this organization, we never do anything less than 100%. Now you get out of here and I don't wanna see you again until you've come back. Right, Danny's laughing already because he's already figured out the punchline, right? Uh, just two different ships passing in the night. Neither one really understood what the other was talking about or requiring in order to do that. But here's the, the real kicker. When that individual learned what the context of that 82% solution was, they realized very quickly that they would have been very happy in the business if they had a 72% solution, because that represented tens of millions to the bottom line in order to do this. And having done that, they got to the 72% solution two years ago. So not understanding what was the actual requirement there by instead working on it as an optimization problem and instead of a satisfaction type problem, they had wasted two years of time to money in this particular organization. Danny, you want to tell a story around that value? That's a, that's a good one. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I'll tell a story, but, um, you know, I, I do know that that we see this question all the time. People are trying to, to, to you know, achieve this. And, you know, all I'm going to say is something that everybody on this call probably already knows is it's not easy because, you know, when you're trying to value something like data, it's directly related to the impact of the insight that resulted from that data. Right. And, you know, so and, and that's a tough thing to measure. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think that the the first thing you should be be doing before you start to, you know, uh, uh, put a, a value on data is, is first start figuring out, you know, what data is being used, what data is, you know, because then there's going to be the cost side of it too, right? You know, because everything, every, every good thing has, has the, the other side equated with it. So it, it is kind of a bit of a holy grail. I haven't seen a lot of people that are, are, uh, you know, they're doing it, whether they're doing it right or whether the, the fact that they did it is making any difference other than, you know, answering a, a number on a, on a balance sheet somewhere. Uh, I, I haven't seen a lot of organizations getting true value out of the exercise yet. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, but I, I would love to hear stories of people that are actually doing that because, you know, I think that there is a way it's just, it's, it's, 
it's interesting. It's an interesting problem. And I'll, I'll add a touch of guidance in there. Danny is so correct when he says it's a tough problem because it really is. If you think back though to total cost of ownership, this was one of the things that we discovered in IT that it wasn't just the cost of the box that was there, but it was the cost of supporting the box. And, and one of the more interesting aspects, I'm a Mac user, so I love to tell this particular story, came out of a very scientific and detailed study they did at NASA, where they found out that the cost of supporting PCs went down as they added more Macintoshes. And they kept saying, but we don't know how to run Macintoshes. How can it be going down? And the answer was Macintoshes at the time needed less service than did the Windows machines. So by adding more Macintoshes to their environment, they were enabled to, they were enabling better support to be provided for the remainder of the group that was still on the IT. Now, we get to that with total cost of ownership. So we say, okay, how much is it? It's the cost of the box? It's the cost of the electricity that goes in the box. We're probably not going to measure that. Um, the cost of a support person to do it, and and maybe a, a cost of an upgrade when we you know drop something or whatever it is that, that needs to go into this. Even if you just find small amounts that you can add up repeatedly. I, I took a, a query that was running at one of the customers that Danny and I were both at at one point in time. And they had a, a you know very gnarly query. It was really interesting to look at, but they'd never understood the process of query optimization. So we simplified the query to where it ran about a third faster. Okay, that's nice. And then you say, how many times a day did that query run? Well, it was well over a billion times. A billion 30% adds up to some very significant. Nice. Did we have the total cost of the ownership? No, we weren't even close. But we were very clearly able to show that in this instance, by understanding the query at a more fundamental level and, and re-optimizing it around that, we were able to save 30% a billion times a day. And it does start to add up. Uh, from a, absolutely. But now, now you got to add to that the uh, return on opportunity. Where else could I have put that money into that would have perhaps not been as interesting as doing a query optimization? Maybe firing the, the holdup guy that takes two days to get their passwords out would have been a more productive piece. Um, would you provide some examples of focusing data activities on business goal achievement? Sure. So when you look specifically at the, the Dan will do this when he does his modeling class. Right? You're relating two things back and forth in a model. What are those business things? What are those business concepts that you're trying to do? So when you talk about data governance activities, if you express them in data terms, you'll end up with the same situation that we ended up before of somebody trying to get from 72% to 82%, not realizing that the problem was completely solved at 72% and, and not having the the, um, the ability to get an insight into that particular area. So when I say expressing goals and business activities, there has to be something that you've taken the trouble to say, when this data thing happens, this business thing happens, and that business thing either costs us money or doesn't cost us money, or you know, again, faster, better, cheaper. It, it all sums up to one of those particular pieces. And it's done so many times, we can now start to put a cost on that. We can now start to say, Let's not talk about getting 100% customer data perfect. Let's talk about salespeople being able to reach somebody by telephone nine times out of 10 when they call them on the first call. Again, just one example of saying that perfect telephone numbers may or may not be in your uh, 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 wheelhouse, but certainly salesperson productivity would absolutely be there. Yeah, and and you know relationships of of different aspects of of business data. How many customers aren't screaming at your tech support people because they don't know that I already have that service that you're trying to sell me? Great example. Right, and what is the the value of that? You know, to me, it's quite high. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm chuckling, Danny, because I get, first of all, I'm the AWS person for the university, which is sort of a crazy thing in the first place. But I get calls all the time. Of, Peter, don't you want to upgrade VCU's phone system? Well, VCU has 35,000 employees and you better believe I am not in charge of providing phone <laughs> service to them. But they don't know this because I'm at the top of the list on the VCU employees that have come in there. So I'm not serving by last name. Probably never a great idea. So there's a couple of comments here that I that um, they're, they're not really questions. They're great comments that kind of summarize a lot of the comments in here. You know, I would say that 
by what the data is actually used for, why is it captured in the first place? And if you're not doing anything with the data or cannot do anything with it, then why would you be capturing it in the first place? We can go a little beyond that one too, because uh, one of the things that Clive taught me over the years was that definitions are good, but purpose statements are better. So mm -hmm. the definition is it's a bed. The purpose statement is, we're gonna use the bed as a tracking device to make sure that we don't lose people in the hospitals. And the tracking device on this bed will tell us what room this bed is in at all times. And of course, you think about that for just a minute and say, so what room is the hallway? Ah, what room is the elevator? Ah, you know, good plan, but it wasn't gonna work in the long run. Purpose statement. Danny, anything you wanna add there? I, unfortunately, I, I missed a little bit of what Peter was saying there on my uh, on my Canadian hamster internet here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, the, the the concept of a purpose statement, you know, uh, you, you know, seen that so many times. You have a a, a systems designer that fit, you know just thinks about what possibly would we want to know. Let's just throw it in there, right? What the heck. Uh, not knowing that, you know, that's going to uh, potentially irritate the customer, you know, uh, blow it out your data with, as you say, uh, not rotten data, but, uh, <laughs> but data that's trivial. Um, uh, so, you know, from that perspective, and, and again, I, as an old data modeler, I, I hate to say it, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of the data modeling process of, the, of, of bring, getting together with your partner in the business and really asking those hard questions. And every data element that you're going to add to a data model should be why and what will this achieve? And you know, then you can ask the other side of that question is, if we don't have it, what do we lose? One of my favorite stories was that Capital One at one point in time was claimed to have the foot size of all their customers. And you know, <laughs> that sounds like pretty, rotten data right uh, as far as i know capital one's never gone into the foot business and, and has never sold our data to any uh, zappos related uh, companies or anything like that but they were data people and they thought it was kind of cute to be able to have that it's a good marketing line once <laughs> 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 you do, and this is make Shannon giggle day. Okay. <laughs> I love it. That's funny. Um, so uh, I just lost my um, question too. Um, so I'm doing a business research project on data management for my MBA. And what I've realized is there's little academic work, data management compared to professional industry, industrial work on data management. How are you working with academics to bridge the gap? Well, you can see my forehead is quite flat. And so we in DEMA uh, worked very closely with a series of vendors, including Danny's company, to try and push these things into the space. Um, I can tell you right at the moment, we've made things worse rather than better. Uh, right now, when you go through a course in IT in a standard accredited American university, and those are the ones that I have experience with, Danny can probably talk about some of the rest of the ones around the world. Um, we don't even mention the concept of case tools, right? That's just crazy. I mean, literally just absolutely crazy. They, 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 they learn project planning with paper and pencil, but they're never taught that there's a product out there called Microsoft product excuse me, project, uh, or better still, that there's a, a wonderful uh, piece of software that keeps track of the interdependencies on your data and the, keeps your data model in fresh and refined form. I mean, when I land someplace, that's the first thing I look at and say, where do I get a hold of the, ca the case tool that's there? They're, they're, students aren't taught this. So the fact that students aren't taught this means they've come out of here thinking that those things are not going to be useful because of course they know Nobody would ever maintain a project by doing all those calculations manually, much less plan a major IT initiative without understanding these things. And so consequently, we've, we've just had no success. So the next thing we tried to do was get to the accreditation boards and say, what is it that you know, we can put into the curriculum? Now you have to remember curriculum are always zero sum games. So if I've got 10 courses that I teach in here, if I'm gonna do a data course, I gotta take something back out. And now you're fighting with somebody about whether they need to have this particular piece in here or whether we're going to smash two courses into one and give them half a 
a, a loaf in, in this context. I'm very disappointed. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm uh, working in conjunction with groups like Danny's and, and others is to try and actually drive this back the other way. We've tried through the proper channels. They aren't getting it. Uh, we've tried through all sorts of different ways. We had uh, one gentleman from IBM who just said, the heck with the accreditation stuff. I'm just simply going to visit colleges and universities and try and teach them how to do this. And most of them got as far as saying, okay, well, I guess we'll take our old operations research program and re relabel it as data science and say, that's done, right? Well, that's the study of algorithms. That's not really the study of data management. So I agree with the question. And unfortunately, we've been working as hard as we can and not making much success. So maybe it's time we get out of the way and let somebody else come in and, and take a crack at it because uh, our efforts have been less than stellar. Yeah. No, I, I hear you, and I don't think it's just a U.S. issue. Uh, you know, my son took a high-end Bachelor of IT technology here, uh, ended up as a ethical hacking specialist, and I looked at the amount of data uh, in his curriculum, and it was almost non-existent, less than when I went to school, you know, 30-odd years ago. Uh, and that data, the one data course that was in mind was the one that changed my life and the reason I'm here, right? So uh, it, it is it is crazy, but, um, you know, uh, we keep trying to push, you know, and, and allow people to use our technology uh, to, to enable them, uh, but they have to have the impetus to, to want to teach it and know that it's something that needs to be teached. And, and you're right, it's, it's a lot of uh, jumping up and down with not a lot of people listening unfortunately. In the data literacy book, I introduced a term called uh, PID. I think Todd, my co-author, came up with it, uh, actually, but it's a perpetual involuntary data donor, P-I-D-D. And <laughs> if you do not understand data, you are simply going to be walking around giving your data to people. Uh, again, just uh, take, uh, you know, a company asks a question, can I get your location? Well, you might say, sure, one time, or maybe while you're using the app. Those are usually the two choices that you're getting. When we've measured these things, we found out that some companies are taking your location data 14,000 times a day. Now, if nothing mm -hmm. else, you ought to be really upset that your battery is going to get very, very weak as a result of doing all that extra work for somebody else on your dime. But uh, again, the, 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 the knowledge level of the public out there is far below where it needs to be. And I think this is one of the things uh, we need to work on as an industry, not just preaching to ourselves, but really trying to get beyond the data people and uh, get to really the citizenry, which is really where this needs to happen. Maybe that, maybe it's pain oriented. Maybe we can, you know, do a better job of, of, of articulating what it means to the, to the common man and move from there as opposed to, you know, trying to elevate it as a, as a, as a science. We could, we could do a, a joint session on that one, Danny, at the next conference, right? I'd, I'd be you got it, buddy. Something like that. Yeah. They're going to let me out of my uh, Canadian uh, cell here at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> Why did you get a COVID test within 24 hours? <laughs> We're all working on that. The COVID tests take longer than, than the trip usually, so it's pretty silly. People are taking COVID tests here in Canada, going to the States, and then coming back and using that test as proof that they're fine. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. We have lots of things we're learning about COVID and data too, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, listen, it's all an opportunity. Absolutely. All right, I have to jump for a uh, 3.30. Peter, Danny, thank Shan. you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, our pleasure to sponsor it. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Really do appreciate it. Thanks, Danny. And thanks to Erwin for sponsoring, as always. Always appreciate the helping to make these webinars happen. We are coming right to the end of the um, webinar here. So I will just again to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session. So many great questions that we didn't have time to get to. I'll get those over to Peter as well. So um, to take a look at, I really love all the comments and the engagement that, that y'all bring to, to these webinars. Um, so again, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much as always. I hope y'all have a great day and happy holidays. Same to you both. Danny, pleasure to see you as always, Shannon. We will see you in a very short amount of time when we all get together back out in San Diego for Enterprise Data World. I love it. Such a good time. All right. Thanks, y'all.
Cheers, everybody.